and I'm going to be dropping the drop the link on you in the general chat here in just a second. Hmm. Yeah, what are we talking about? What are we going to do today? What are we going to do today? Take over the world. That's pretty that's pretty aggressive, but I respect it. But you're pinky and I'm the brain. <laughs> Is that right? Apparently. <laughs> okay, no, that's you know, that's a thing. Okay, there we go. There's the link. And I'm going to drop it into the schedule like I always do first thing. Um where are we? Pinky in the brain is a, that's a flashback right there. Um, okay, today's the 21st. All right, okay, that is now dropped into the uh, class schedule on Canvas. So link to this on class schedule uh, on Canvas, all cooked. We are ready to go. Um, and I like it. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Let me see. Only, I only have one kind of housekeeping reminder for everybody, which is, uh, a reminder that, that we have in the text channels we have the dmq you can see it over there the dmq is where you go to just drop your requests for anything that's anything that's like really particular to you um you know can i ha can i get someone to go through my homework with me or can i find out how i did on you know some exam or can i walk through whatever any of those kinds of requests you know, we've talked about this, but I want to just remind everyone to go to the DMQ and just drop your little note that just says something that's non, you know, non super specific and non, you know, nothing that breaks confidentiality, for example, right? That just kind of goes, hey, you know, could I get someone to go through my module one homework with me? Something really, you know, so we kind of have a sense of what's going on. Uh, even without that, we'll still just jump in, but it helps us a little bit to kind of know. But something very minimal it just sits there either me or walter or zach will just you know we're always looking at that channel and we'll just jump on and dm you um and then when we've resolved you know what your thing is then we'll delete that message out of the dm queue so it's very much like showing up and taking a number you know at the dmv hopefully we're kinder cooler nicer than the dmv um but you know what I mean? It is like taking a number. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Um, although I have to say, while I'm pulling up the lecture slide Olas for today, I do have to say that um, the, uh, the DMV in Provo is actually, I think, remarkably efficient. It's my take. Okay. I'm not like sucking up to the DMV and I don't say that about a lot of, you know, sort of government run uh, entities, but I think the Provo DMV is really, really well run. You know, you show up, you walk in, you take the, what is your thing? I want to do this number, sit down five minutes, maybe tops. Boom. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Gomez, same thing, man. Never. Um, Josh, you missed everything. You missed everything. So, um, but it's okay because it's on YouTube and you can go back and watch it. So, um, but reminder on the DMQ, okay? That is the way. We're getting a few general kinds of, we're getting a few requests coming on the on the uh, general uh, text channel. And uh, just as a reminder, ideal to throw those in the DMQ. We can jump on a DM and help you out, okay? Um, all right. Okay, so we are actually right here in the slides. This is essentially 
Uh, module one, part three. We will wrap up. Due date's already been set to Saturday, right? 48 hours after we're done, but we'll be done now. There already are something like a dozen or more uh, homework ones that are done and a few um, you know, module one exams. So play bingo and you know be ready and we're gonna we're gonna kick it in okay so what we've what we've already talked about so far um in in this module one getting us going we talked the first day about introduction to the course and all that kind of stuff and uh what we're talking about now is uh levels of abstraction right we were we did the abstraction levels you know from low to high we did the google lady um, we talked about how we're going to start at the bottom, you know, and, and how we're going to go transistors and we're, how we're going to, how the course flows. What we're going to do now is try to just relate that, but go the other way. It won't take that long, but we want to try to look at, okay, I show up and I've got a problem that I want to solve and I want to solve it somehow through, you know, through computers how do I get from there to electrons, right? We did kind of the other way around. We're going to flip it and go back the other way, okay? Um, this is sort of our, this is our abstraction, right? That we're going to talk about. Um, we're learning from the bottom up. We're taking each of these and lower to higher in terms of what we're teaching during the semester. But we're going to just look at problem solving and how that fits again and how it weaves all this together, okay? And we'll talk about each one of these. Um, when we start talking about problems, problem statements, sometimes in software, we, we refer to that as requirements, software requirements. That's like a specification of what it is we're going to build, what, the, what we think the customer wants, right? What, what is the dog food that the dogs are going to eat, right? There's requirements. Well, it turns out that that, Problem statements are typically done using uh, natural language, right? Uh, in, you know, in our circle here, it's English. It doesn't matter what natural language it is. They're all ambiguous. And probably English is, in many respects, more ambiguous than most, maybe all. Um, the definition, by the way, some of you are going to get yourself wrapped around your axle because of ambiguity and also uh, abstraction, you're going to confuse these, and algorithm, and there's just too many A words. Um, you've got to, these, you know, ambiguity and abstraction are words that should be part of your operating vocabulary of life. And if they, if you've gotten to this point without mastering them, it's a good time to lock that in and use that in your regular conversations. But here's a definition of ambiguity you know, or something being ambiguous. It is that there are two possible, at least two possible interpretations. Okay. Now this is actually, uh, I want to just say this. And by the way, that is a, this is a bingo moment. Okay. Um, but I want to just say this. When there are people who don't understand this idea, and they'll say, they'll say something. I don't know what's a good example of an ambiguous statement. And you're like, yeah, I'm not sure I know if, I'm not sure, you know, I understand what you mean. Um, sorry, chapstick moment. Uh, my lips hurt real bad. Um, but you'll say that I've had this experience where I'll say to somebody, yeah, that statement, you know, I'm not, you know, you're like, you'll, you'll hit up an engineer maybe and you'll say, yeah, there's in the spec, it says this one thing. And I wasn't completely sure whether by that you meant this or you meant that. And then they'll look at you like you're stupid and go, well, yeah, obviously it means, you know, that. And you're like, well, it's not 100% obvious, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a, you know, the statement as written is a little ambiguous. And then they might say, no, it's not. Okay. Then you don't understand the definition of ambiguous. Ambiguous means it can be interpreted. If they're, if they really are saying, if you're saying it's ambiguous and they say, no, it's not, 
The only position that makes any sense on their point is that you as an individual are irrational or in some other way, your logic and your reasoning and your understanding of language is flawed. Okay. Because by definition, ambiguous means it can be interpreted. And if somebody goes, no, that's not ambiguous. Normally what that actually means is that they themselves, um, that they themselves don't have the introspection, the power to perceive that what they have said isn't, you know, they have their own vision is kind of stunted. So they don't even see that it can be viewed different ways. You know, they lack the introspection or the self-awareness to understand that what they have said, or they're just crazy defensive, which is another problem, right? But, but unless you yourself just flat out don't understand, right? Uh, language or whatever, barring that, or you're just irrational, barring that, if somebody says to you that something that you've said or written is ambiguous, uh, 90 high 90s, it is. And if you don't see it, then that's an opportunity to look inside and think about what else around you do you not see, right? Or someone's like, oh, how can that be? I don't understand that. Or people will say, uh, you get a lot of black and white uh, thinking and statements on on social media. You know, I was watching a post about uh, HOAs. Just watching, I saw a, a little thread about HOAs this morning on Facebook. Why am I burning my time? I don't know because I'm an idiot. But somebody was talking about HOAs, and I'm just intrigued because I live in a place where there are, where there's an HOA, and and I've not really had any. You know, and somebody's like. HOAs don't do anything to add any value. All they do is take your money and then they don't do anything. And I'm like, okay, that just has to be patently false. Now, whether what they do is worth the money, separate question. You know, whether they should do more, separate question. Whether their regulations are over are overreaching, separate question. But th for the most part, you know, it's doing something. And then the question is whether you value that, right? Or you, or that you even agree with it, but like they don't do anything as a patently false statement. Uh, you know, this is more of a 305 G discussion that we talk about in there, you know, living online, right? Um, Matthew suggests I'm going to clean your clock. Uh, right, right, right. Are you the janitor? <laughs> are you the janitor or are you a street fighter? You know, is this happening at a bar or is the janitor come to your office? Uh, you know, these are, these are, that's a clearly almost all idiomatic expressions um, uh, have uh, ambiguity, you know, built in, right? They're, they're, they're idiomatic for a reason. Okay. So, that's my little speech about, and this is also just a little lesson for life. Think about, think about your life. You need to go home and rethink your life. Um, you don't want to sell me death sticks. So, uh, okay. We call that ambiguity. It is all around us. Our, the nature of our language is, is ambiguous. It takes effort to say things in ways that are, that are unambiguous. The process of looking at a problem or a statement or a spec or anything and rendering it unambiguous, we call that disambiguation. It, it, it sounds like a crazy word, but all it means is just like, you know, let's make this thing not ambiguous anymore, disambiguate. Um, but at, in any case, once you understand the problem unambiguously, then you can start trying to figure out what the best ways are to solve it. And that gets you into algorithms, okay? But before we go there, here's some examples, practical examples. The Mars Climate Orbiter, which was 23 years ago, 22 years ago, okay? Uh, I remember when this happened, you're too young, or you might be too young. Most of you are too young to remember when this actually happened as an event, unless you were like, you know, four and like really into the news and science news. But in December, they launched this Mars Climate Orbiter, right? What was it going to do? It was going to orbit Mars in order to 
you know, learn about the Martian climate. Um, it, it goes out, man, for almost a year it takes traveling to Mars and then it burns up entering the Martian atmosphere and crashes best as we can, the best we can tell it crashes into the surface of Mars. Why? Why? And here's why. It turns out that working on this project, among the groups working on this, was NASA. Of course, it was a NASA project. But also Lockheed Martin had, a, had portions of this thing. And there was a module created by Lockheed Martin, okay, that produced a value of that was supposed to be um, force. And this is out of my wheelhouse. I've had all this stuff in physics long ago. I don't hang on to it. But Lockheed's module, software module, produced the calculations and did things that produced this force value. And NASA consumed that value. So one, one module created a number and handed the number to another module. That's it. Problem was that in the specification, it had not specified what the units were. That's ambiguous. And Lockheed Martin's software produced units in pound force seconds, which if my slide is correct, is a thing in physics. Uh, NASA expected the units in Newton seconds. And I don't even know like how similar those are. I've looked it up somewhere in the past and then I let it go because I don't care. Point just being the numbers they they were not the same, right? The, the, there was that ambiguity. Crashes. So what happens is at the point at which they needed that information, the calculations were wrong. And instead of like going into orbit, it like, you know, nosedives, you know, because it's managing its rockets and boosters and stuff incorrectly. Uh, that one error, that that specification error relating to ambiguity cost NASA... $300 million in a failed mission. There was another one that actually happened later, the, the uh, polar lander that also crashed. And that's another story. And that actually led to discussions and Senate hearings, congressional hearings about possibly shutting NASA down. So what's the cost of ambiguity in software? It can be really, really high. Okay, that's the bottom line. Now, this one... I just wanted to share this because this was literally last week, friend of mine who was, who, who was being sworn in as an attorney, right? Past the bar and whatever. This is an interesting thing. Uh, he gets this letter and he shares it with me and he goes, and he just says, read this, Chuck, read this paragraph. First went to administrative order number blah. You have the option of performing your oath in absentia. This is because of pandemic. He's, you know, doing the oath like remotely, right? Via video. To complete your oath in absentia as of three days from your certification on 1-12-2021, the oath may be administered by a notary or anyone authorized to administer oaths in any U.S. jurisdiction or territory. And he just gives me this. He goes, read this paragraph. I go, okay. And he goes, How about, when, when, when is the last moment at which I can complete my oath in absentia? What are the possible interpretations? Can we uh, we get a little shout out, either either voice or uh, or audio uh, or text? What are the options to complete your oath in absentia as of three days from your certification on one twelve? The oath may be administered. What do you say? No, but it says it says three days, so that's not an answer. So Tanner, three days is what it says. That that's not. So what's the what's the date? What's the time and day? Yeah, Matthew. No, it's not whenever. Uh, like the fifteenth. Well, these are guesses, though, right? But what are the other possibilities? What else could it be? Well, right, right, yeah. So so um. So Bray, you know, Bray raises the issue. What about the ninth? Because it says, you know, as of three days from, what does that, what does from mean, right? Is that three days 
after, or could it be three days distance, positive or negative? My presumption would be after, but I think that language is a little bit ambiguous, right? Um, right. You know, but any, no, and right, three as of three days from, you know, right. So does it mean, it could, it could mean anytime after three days after, right? Now, what if you say, what if you say, okay, I think it means that the certification, uh, also, it doesn't say the date. It does say three days from your certification on January 12th. Well, what if the certification was at noon? Do I have three days from noon? Or is it three days from midnight that night? Or is it three days from, you know, midnight 1201 or whatever earlier that day? And Bray, yes, it is a big oof when it's a bunch of lawyers writing this. Yes, yes. And so my buddy actually contacted them and said, what's the actual last time and day? Right. Um, I doubt they did it on purpose. Uh, Braden, like seriously, I bet you like a thousand dollars. It wasn't on purpose. Um, Ten thousand dollars. I'm up in my bet the more I think about it. Right. OK, what about this? Is it the 15th? Let's just say a, an assumption that it starts somehow on the 12th and it's three days and it's after and that the time doesn't matter just any time that day. Is it the 14th or the 15th? Right? Is the 12th inclusive or exclusive? Remember this from number theory? You know, little number lines, right? Is that number excluded or included? If I say, you know, if I say, give me a number, if I say, give me a number from one to 10, you think it's probably, you know, one is included and 10 is included. But if I said, give you a number between one and 10, I think it's far more ambiguous, right? Give me a number between one and 10. Okay, do you mean literally between? So that would be the options are from two to nine inclusive. You see what I mean? Now, when you write a for loop and you write, you're writing code, there's no ambiguity. The for loop starts when it starts per, per the language you're writing in, you know? There's no guessing work, right? Exactly. Thank you, Matt. That's the, that's the notation. As Matthew said, parens, you know, one comma 10 or brackets, one comma 10, right? And honestly, I don't even remember which one was inclusive and which one is exclusive. I don't, I think, I'm not even going to guess. I know that one is one and the other is the other, right? Yeah, Gabe. So yeah, why don't we all, let's just, I think obviously that's sarcasm. Let's just all talk like robots and say precisely what they mean so that nobody has to be confused. So a couple of things on that, Gabe. Number one, when it's specifying software, it does in fact have to be precise so that nobody has to be confused. Number two, that doesn't mean you're talking like a robot. You know what I mean? You can you can be precise in your language without, then it's a, it's a bit of a straw man to say, well, if you're being precise, you're being a robot. No, robots are precise, but all precision is not robotic, right? And there is a part where we do, uh, where we communicate imprecisely, right? So anyway, um, uh, yeah, that's right. So, right. So you mentioned, you know, right, his wife's autistic and she's like, why can't people say what they mean? Because, and this is not uncommon when you're on the spectrum, there's a tendency to be more literal, right? As opposed to figurative. And literal language is less ambiguous and figurative language, right, Gabe? And figurative language is more ambiguous, you know? Uh, and that's a thing, right? And I and I have, you know, people that I love very, very dearly that that have Asperger's or are on the spectrum, you know, somewhere and and they struggle, struggle with certain kinds of humor because it's a level of abstraction and their brain just doesn't work like that, you know. And others of us, like me, tend to live in a world where abstraction is part of the fun, and then there's that disconnect. But in software, no matter where you are, in software, you got to drill down and be precise. You can't be guessing at that point. Um, yeah. So anyway, this is interesting, right? Interesting stuff. Okay. But that was literally that was literally last week that that my friend just like 
uh, read this paragraph and tell me when. And it turns out it was end of business day on the 15th. Now, that's not a bad guess, but that is not what this says. OK. Um, and I agree. And I agree that there's a lot of beauty in language, you know, when, uh, you know, when in that in that figurative space, there's a lot of beauty. Right. Poetry operates in that space. Humor and comedy operates in that space. Um, there's also beauty in precision, but it's a different kind of beauty. Right. So Sam asks, you know, what would what would what would that be called? Disambiguity trying to solve the problem? No, not trying to solve the problem. Disambiguity, disambiguation is the process of making something not ambiguous. So it is clarifying what my friend did when he contacted whoever the the bar, you know, when he contacted them, he was engaging in disambiguation because he was dealing with their statement that was ambiguous and and clarifying with precision what that meant, right? So they could have said, right, you have the following window of time starting on the day that you received certification and ending at, you know, on the, at the end of the business day, you know, three days after the third day after whatever, I don't even know, right? But there's a way of making that statement more concrete. Um, right. Um, yeah. So if you say, I'm going to clean your clock um, and you're the janitor, disambiguation would be to say, hey, sorry to, sorry to bother you. I know you're working. I'm the janitor. And I've just been told I'm supposed to clean this clock up here. That would be disambiguation. And I would go, oh, I know what he's doing now. He's not here to fight me. It's the process by which I take something ambiguous and I seek the clarity so I know exactly. If you were NASA, if you were NASA, disambiguation would have been, when I got the spec, it would have been, um, oh, uh, what are the units for the force? Lockheed Martin or NASA could have asked that. What are the units? And they would have said, oh, it's Newton seconds. Great. That would be disambiguation as opposed to force. Okay. That entire process. I don't know what midichlorians have to do with anything. Um, and Gabe, I'm with you on the metric system. I'm buying the uh, on it, man, on it. Uh, I used to build homes <laughs> in America with tape measures or quarter, five thirty seconds. Da, you know. But when you do. Uh, Tape measures with metro with uh, with what do we call that? Is that called the English system? I call it the dumb system. Um, you do get really good at base two, you know, half inch, quarter inch, eighth inch, sixteenth. Is it imperial? Uh, empiric? Not empirical. Well, it's yeah, it's got to be imperial. There is a thing called empirical, which is a different thing entirely as well. Okay, I'll buy that. I don't remember obviously, um, but you do get good at base two, two four. Right, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. That's imperial. That's also imperial. Um, okay. So we move from problem statements, disambiguating the statement of the problem, and then we work our way into algorithms. Okay. Now, algorithms. Um, that is a word, by the way, that uh, actually comes from Arabic, al Khwarizmi. Um, who was a, a ancient, ancient, I don't even remember, it's, I don't even know, long time ago, um, uh, I, my, I, I've got, actually, I've lectured on this in another class, but the bottom, the bottom word is, bottom uh, line is, uh, there was a book, and when it was translated into uh, uh, Latin, I believe, then the, the, the name of the author got transformed into algorithmi and this becomes algorithms and um that's kind of where that comes from but the idea of, of an algorithm as we think of it now it's really just like a set of rules or a recipe for something it is not a computer science thing exclusively by any stretch okay um so if i say um how do you make, I made lasagna by my first time unsupervised making lasagna in my life. It was good. 
it came out really good. But I did like grab the little recipe on the back of the lasagna noodle package as a little guidance. I knew the basic idea, but I was like, yeah, you know, there's a few dynamics like what goes first it could be in trouble if you put the wrong thing on the pan at the bottom, right? What goes there? Uh, you know what I mean? So the Betty Crocker cookbook or any cookbook is an example of algorithms, right? How do you make, I don't, I don't even care. You know, how do you make your morning coffee? How do you make uh, hot chocolate? How do you make lasagna, right? How do you sort a list, right, of, of numbers? How do I, how do I, how do I? The algorithm is a description of how you do the thing. But you got to know what the problem was in the first place. What is it I'm trying to do? Now I can explore, like, different ways of doing it, right? And kind of figure out what I think is maybe the best way or maybe the most efficient way, right? Um, there is a, uh, I don't remember which number in our curriculum, but there's, you know, at least one of the classes that deals with what we sometimes refer to as algorithmic complexity, because it turns out that there are certain ways of doing things that are horribly inefficient, you know, that are okay when you're doing it for your assignment, but when you try to then scale it to like a hundred people or 10,000 people or a million people hit your website, everything just crashes because you, because your algorithm is not scalable, right? Meaning uh, I can describe this in algebraic terms in terms of N, right? So my algorithm operates in like, you know, N squared, right? You give me N items, like a sorting algorithm. You give me N items and It'll take me n squared, you know, operations to do that. Um, it's not possible to sort a list on the order of n, because that's the left. Just the time it takes me to even read a list is n, right? N items, and I read n items. Now I know some things, but you know, to sort it, I got to go back again and do stuff. Um, you know. Their bubble, you know, algorithm is like the bubble sort, which is, I don't know why anybody ever taught it in the first place, did it. It's like the dumbest, stupidest, most inefficient algorithm. And I really wish it would just die the death and go away. Okay. And I think that the bubble sort actually operates like N cubed or something absurd in terms of its sort of, we call it order of magnitude, the relative efficiency. Maybe somebody can look that up. The best sorting algorithms operate on the order of n log n, meaning n times the log of n, and that's the complexity. That's how it's going to scale. Okay. But anyway, that's all. That's, so algorithms have, there are good ones and bad ones. There are efficient ones and inefficient ones. There are ones that are really accurate and others that aren't. There are algorithms that, uh, uh, you know, that are easy to understand or hard to understand. You know what I mean? They're just there, but it's, it's the ways we look at problem solving, essentially solutions to the problems. That's probably good. Um, by the way, in case you're interested, as you get into computer science, the provably worst possible sorting algorithm that is still guaranteed to eventually yield, uh, is it N, is it N squared? Um, is it, and it's great. You know, to me, it feels emotionally worse. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for that, for dropping that Wikipedia on bubble sort. Yeah. Um, and thank you for the Chinese recipes, right? That's actually not even just Chinese recipes, right? My, I remember my mom actually um, trying to learn uh, some of the great dishes that my, that my grandmother did, right? My dad would be like, uh, my, my mom used to do this thing, whatever. And she, um, this is relevant to, to algorithms, but I remember hearing the story about my mom saying to her mother-in-law, I need to learn how to do, you know, these five things or whatever. She's like, okay, well, I'll just, I'll make it. You can just watch. So she'd be like, no, no, no. She'd grab the salt. She'd like throw it in, shake some salt in her hand. And then my mom would be like, stop. And then grab that and like put it in something and then put it in like measuring spoons to see like how much that was and write that down and convert it into, right, into a disambiguated, that was disambiguation, uh, convert it into a more concrete, you know, sort of algorithm that, that would be more replicable, you know, when you don't have the feel for it. But yeah, you know, 
Want to know the exact amount? Feel it in your heart. There's a lot of that, right? Um, so anyway, um, yeah, what's, I don't know what your question means, Josh. It's an ambiguous question. I don't know what you mean by it. Um, so I, I'm buying. I'm, I'm okay with that being N squared if that's what you mean. I don't know what you mean by that, Josh. So help me out here. Um, okay, that's algorithms. Oh, the worst possible. I don't know if this is official, but um, some some uh, associates folks came up with an idea that they called the umbogo sort, and the umbogo sort essentially consisted of taking a list of items that you wanted to be sorted, and just randomly ordering the list. Then you um, then you check the list to see. Uh, I would assume Wikipedia is correct on that, Josh. Um, I have no reason to believe it would not be correct. I just feel like bubble sort needs to be taken out and flogged. Uh, but the embogo sort says, take the list, randomly order it, check to see if it's sorted. If it is, you're done. If not, randomly order it again. Okay, that, that's a serious, that's a bad boy sorting algorithm right there. I believe the big O on that would be what we call big O. The order of magnitude on that, I think, would be something like N factorial or something. It's essentially... The probability that if you randomly sort any list that it will be sorted, that's the order of magnitude of that algorithm. But it will, it will eventually yield a sorted list. Don't do this at home. Don't try this at home. Okay. Some things that the book talks a little bit about this, but just some things that are important when you talk about software. I said, right, that it doesn't have to be about computers. Fine. But within the context of computers and software, there are a few ideas that are very important. One is definiteness, which is precision. In my view, algorithms by their nature don't have to be about computers. Therefore, they don't have to be precise in the same way that a computer algorithm has to be precise, definite, as we call it. The other one is effective computability. Again, that's only relevant for a computer or a computing system of some form which is that it can be computed by a computer. Um, and then the third one, again, that's relevant within the context of software is finiteness. And all that means is that it's going to stop. It's going to stop. Now, again, outside of, I don't even know that I fully believe that. To me, that's a subset. I think that there are algorithms that don't stop. My opinion, it doesn't matter. It's not going to be on the exam. Um, but, uh, the umbogo sort, let me see. Oh, the yeah, the best case is is, uh, is N, right? Because you you just randomly sort it. You randomly order it and it works. But is it N times N factorial? Is that really it, Josh? N times N factorial? Nice. That, yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. Okay, anyway, that's, that's algorithms, okay? Um, once you have an algorithm, which is a solution a good solution to the problem. It, it meets your objectives for solving that problem. It's the least cost, it runs the most efficiently, it burns the least memory, you know what I mean? Once you have that, then you've got to code it up in a way that a computer can run it, okay? So with problems and algorithms, we're still in a human domain. But when we get to a programming language, now we're into, the land of computers, okay? And um, so there are, li this may seem really strange to you, especially if all you've really been exposed to is like Python. Now that's okay. That's nothing wrong with that. If you just started in, might be all you've touched so far. But to realize that there are literally thousands of programming languages, right? In the same way that I think there are still thousands of natural languages. That'd be an interesting question. Uh, can somebody pop that up? What's somebody, how many natural languages there are estimated to be? But I mean, some of those are very small groups, right? Unique languages that are maybe only one. Uh, in, in the smallest groups would be like tribes somewhere. Um, the smallest uh, in like sort of um, town, cities, counties, regions, you get a lot of regional dialects in Europe across the European countries, Italy, France, Germany, etc. Um, you'll get a lot of those that are not just like one family or one tribe, but a community 
uh, of maybe, you know, could be thousands of speakers, right? All the way, you know, when I'm saying tribes, I'm talking about like down to like, you know, 10 people or 20 people or something like that. So I'm talking about, um, two, th- uh, let me see how many 7,000 languages, approximately natural languages, human languages. And about 2,000 of those have fewer than 1,000 speakers. That's obviously an estimate, except for 7,117, which is not an estimate. It might still be an estimate, but it's more of a precise number. Okay, you got to pick a language. You got to have a language. And so in computer science, we try to teach you about different languages that partake of different paradigms. In CS4450 is analysis of programming languages. We talk about declarative languages and imperative languages and functional programming and object-oriented programming, imperative programming, logic programming, uh, you know, database programming. They, They have different goals, different objectives. They run in different kinds of systems and the languages are different. Okay. Um, later on in, in, in that class, you know, when I taught it, uh, but in other classes, I love to talk about the superior wharf hypothesis, uh, you know, which relates to kind of the in, the the relationship between natural language um, and thought, right? Can you can you think thoughts for which there is no language, you know, and and you know that that matches or you know that has no vocabulary to express that idea, and there's a bit of a cyclic relationship there, but it's very interesting. But in any case, there are probably I'm going to call out and say there's probably a couple hundred that are used commercially. Okay, that are like the languages that get used commercially, and there's a top. You know, the, your career you'll probably use at least a dozen languages that you'll get decent at. You know, that you'll have good skill at. A little different than than kind of natural language, you know, stuff. Um, looking back and scanning. Yeah, twenty three languages encompass half the world's population. That, by the way is going to follow a uh, power law distribution, uh, kind of a Pareto law or a zip distribution uh, or a list distribution um, where uh, it's, it's actually a, the, the Pareto distribution is a naturally occurring phenomenon where like 20% of something covers 80% of whatever, 20% of the, you know, of the languages are going to, you know, uh, be spoken by 80% of the population uh, it's an, it's a, anyway, it's a principle created, discovered by Italian economist Pareto. Um, and it is, it is sort of descriptively true in nature. It is a, if you're interested, look up Pareto, P-A-E-R-T-O. And there's a, um, look up, there we go. Um, Yeah, and it's not actually Pareto is not strictly cause and effect, Matt. I'm you know, and I know that's kind of a that's classic. The other one is um, I think this is spelled right. A zip distribution. I'm just typing it into the chat. Is that did I do that right? Um, let me see, like zip flaw. Um, which relates to language, Zipf's law, it's hard to say, states that given a large sample of words, the frequency of any words is inversely proportional to its rank in the frequency table. That's that's the Zipf law or Zipf distribution. Um, Anyway, just dropping a few tidbits on you in case case you find that, you know, cool, right? and there's another one, but I got to go look it up. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's a similar idea, right? So in other words, and I think that actually the, the zip distribution actually says that the first, the most common word in the English language, which is probably the or a or something, um, that the second, that it occurs twice as often as number two. And that number two occurs like, I don't even know if it's, if it's twice as often as number three, you know, or if, or if number three occurs a third, you know, as often as that one, but it creates this power law distribution. 
that is very fascinating. And it is loosely, it loosely follows a Pareto principle as well. Um, anyway, that's a, that's another topic, but I, I recommend it. If that hooks you at all, go into that space. But languages. So you're going to have to learn a bunch of languages by the time you're done. So what we try to do in the curriculum is equip you not only to know the languages that are popular right now, but to understand the theory that underlies those languages. That allows you to adapt when the next languages pop up or maybe even create the next languages that pop up, right? Because all the, the languages are always responses to some need, some problem to solve. And you're like, you know what? If I had something that I'll call SQL this would be easier. If I had something called, you know, R for statistical stuff, it would be easier. If I had a thing called MATLAB, if I had a thing called C, C++, right? It's always an attempt to create tools that are better designed, you know, to do a certain thing. Well, it turns out that languages can also be high level and they can be low level, okay? Let's talk about that for just a second. A high level language is one that's more abstracted away from hardware. And a low level language is one that's more dependent on the hardware. So again, voice comments, chat, either way. But what do you think? Based upon your limited knowledge at this stage, even, you know, what would you, and you can even just, if you're gonna do this in the comments, you know, state whether you're going high or low, right? You know, like high colon, and what you think might be there, examples of low, what, what do you think? What say you? What do you got? See, Josh, you did it wrong, man. Py Thank you. Python is high. <laughs> yeah, just saying Python, like, ah, don't know. Um, that's right. What say you, Gabe? Um, and voice comments are fine as well. If you just unmute, you can just drop it in. And tell me what you think. Um, let me see. Uh, nice for those. Actually, I want to just I want to just uh, put that on the big screen for those watching on YouTube. Uh, this was offered up by um, uh, by Matthew. Stop making fun of different languages. C is fast. Java is popular. Ruby is cool. Python is beautiful. JavaScript, uh, Haskell is intriguing. Yes, that's that's good. I like that. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, don't make fun of the other languages, really. They're trying to do the best. Uh, Java, Kotlin, hi. I think, yeah, yeah. Scratch, I don't know Scratch. Gomez, don't know, I don't know Scratch. C is lower, thank you, Bryce. Yeah, C++ higher, but not as high as Python. Absolutely. In other words, there's a gradation, right? Um, do you know why C was built? Why, why the C programming language was actually like created um, really in the first place? Because that language C was created in a, in a time when the world was pretty much uh, assembly language, which is what we're talking about here. We're not hitting it yet, but we're going to get there. Right? Anybody know? Just off the top of your head? Why, what C was built to do? It was literally built as a language because it was a project that was that was that they wanted to do. Uh, the group was at Bell Labs, and the project. The only option they really had, I mean, Fortran existed, COBOL existed. You know, there were some high level languages. Um, there were languages like Pascal and and um, uh, PL one and uh, Algol. There were languages, okay, like Algol 67 and the things that followed after it. Uh, Josh is close, systems for many computers. What systems? Okay, uh, I will tell you. They were trying to write um, an operating system. The operating system that they, they were, so they're trying to write, they want, they needed a high level language that made it really, really easy to hook hardware, to talk directly to hardware. And that's when they came up with C. And then they wrote the CS, the C compiler in assembly language, because that's what they had. That was the best thing they could do. Once they had written a C compiler in assembly language, they rewrote the compiler in C and compiled it using the assembly-based compiler and then threw that code away and essentially bootstrapped 
that process so that the C compiler is written in C and there isn't an assembly compiler. There isn't an assembly based compiler, as far as I know, in existence anymore. That's kind of funky, right? That's kind of cool, I think. Um, so they built, and then they built, and then having built the language that enabled them to do that, then they used C to build Unix. And what you see, if you look at the code to Unix or you look at the code to Linux or, you know, other similar sort of Unix knockoffs, um, you'll see some modules built in assembly language. It's a very low level. They got to be right there in the hook. And then it's C to get to those. Um, that's the kind of thing. C++ is just C with like lipstick and a Gucci purse. How am I doing? Did I offend anybody yet? Um, I mean, really, C++, it's, it's C with an object, wearing an object-oriented dress, you know? And I mean, it's dolled up in some way, but you're like, ah, that's still kind of C. It's still C. And then Java was an attempt to kind of go, you know what, really, pointers, stop. Stop with the pointers. We don't care. Oh, garbage, you don't do garbage collection. You have to do your own memory management. You got memory leaks. Your software just crashes the system in every, you know, within a week. If you didn't happen to manually catch every mistake in your garbage, you know, in the memory management, Java goes, hold my beer. I got this. Okay. You know, hold my mouse. I think I got this. And Java's like, you know, we'll do the high level stuff. You know, and we're going to be so independent. We'll have our own Java virtual machine and we'll write to bytecode and it'll just run everywhere. We, we got this C. Good. We got this C++. Nice try. But uh, yeah, why don't we take over from here? C sharp, uh, you know, similar, similar thing. Let's, let's do some stuff that uh, I'm not a C sharp expert. Um, but anyway, so really rust of that. So Dallin, are you a rust aficionado? Uh, we should talk later. Um, yeah, first, the first compiler written in C and then rewrote it in Rust. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, you get the idea. You get the idea that all of that, all of those levels, it's levels of abstraction, even within the language. Are you higher level or are you narrower? Similarly with natural language, um, what about like, if you go like, I got a son in med school right now, right? And I got another son-in-law in law school, right? Okay, when you go to med school, you know you've got to learn a certain kind of lingo, right, to talk to doctors. You've got to understand vocabulary, Latin roots. There's a bunch of things that, that make it so that doctors can talk efficiently to doctors, so that they can write specifications, prescriptions, and what, what have you. Same thing with, with the law, right? There are certain things that have, that have concrete meaning that are ambiguous, you know, um, that there are, there are terms that are ambiguous in English in just natural language spoken social interaction that when that same word occurs in say the law or in the field of medicine, it has a very specific and concrete, you know, meaning and you don't get all the, and it's disambiguated because otherwise we got to re-explain it every time we talk about it. True of computer science right? We have words in, com in computer science that have very concrete meanings uh, that we, we in, the, in the context of programming, we don't bring all the other meanings in. Like if you have a for loop, for is a very specific meaning. You don't get all the other English meanings of for because we have to disambiguate. Okay. So the abstraction is still there. Okay. Here's where we go then. You got to write that code. And when you write that code um, in a programming language, it's got to be made accessible, right, to the hardware. And by the way, sign that you are still a noob in the world of programming is when you refer to codes, okay? Codes is like, I don't know what codes is, but nobody writes codes, okay? That's just, if you don't, you know, if you're, there's a small subset that are so new at this field, you still don't know that. Because you've watched some bad movies where they said something like, can you hack into the codes? Okay, code is like, is a word like moose, um, you know, that's always plural, you know, it's, uh, it's singular and plural. I'm going to write, I'm going to write code. 
I'm going to look at the code. There are reasons why, and we'll actually look at it because down in the assembly language and in the machine language are in fact codes. And that's why we began to talk about looking at the code. But today it is a singular term code. Show me the code. I don't have access to the code. I'm writing some code. Okay. Just that's that's just for your FYI, so you can brush up your literacy and not make that mistake. But someone's got to take your your um, your high level language that you wrote in your Java code or your your C, your C plus plus, your whatever, and turn that into assembly language, which is the low lower level human readable code software language, and we call that a compiler. That's what that is called. It compiles the program, the program you write, it compiles it into something much more low level, like, like assembly language. Okay. Then there's an assembler that takes that assembly language code and turns that into machine language or machine code. That is the actual ones and zeros that the machine uses to run. Okay. Those are the lowest level instructions to the hardware itself. And then below that is what we call a, a, an instruction. ISA stands for Instruction Set Architecture. Not going to make you remember that. But just think of it as it's the low-level architecture. It's the hardware architecture. Um, yeah, it is possible, Bryce, to go from high-level to machine language. But in doing so inside the compiler, there will be a step that will essentially be assembly. And then from there, a reduction into the machine language. So you, you might not produce assembly language, you know what I mean, on your way to machine language. Um, but even if you don't, the step kind of has to happen, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. So Josh asks, uh, where does an interpreter fit in? Thank you. Uh, the interpreter, is that like, is that another name for a compiler? No, but they're like first cousins. Okay. An interpreter, think of an interpreter as a compiler but it runs in real time and it only looks at one line of code at a time. So you, so JavaScript, it runs in an interpreter. Um, Python runs, can, you know, you can compile, you can compile anything into an executable, but, but JavaScript, Java, um, Java is not interpreted, can be. Um, Python, um, these are, these are languages that, um, the reason you can get in a Python in Python world and like get a prompt and type something and it'll respond is because it's interpreting every line you type. And if you give it an entire program, it'll interpret the entire program. And even then it will interpret it one line at a time. So it's kind of like compiling only one line and then running it. And there are pros and cons, Josh, to, to compiled, which gives you this program that you run, load it into memory and it runs versus an interpreted language that has to have an interpreter running while you do it. So what I'm saying, Bryce, is that not that it has to convert into assembly language, but that from high level language like, like Java, between Java and byte and the actual bytecode instructions, there is a part where you were inside the compiler it like knows that this is the blah, blah, blah instruction, which is essentially the assembly language moment. And then it has to translate that idea into the ones and the zeros. Okay. Cause there's a, there's a conceptual step where the high level language um, has certain meaning and there's, this is what the compiler class is all about has meaning. And you have to distill all that out into a, a world that looks like the assembly language conceptually. And then you either spit out the assembly language or you hang on to the idea and then you convert it inside into a uh, machine language. Does that make sense? I think hopefully um, to, uh, to Bryce's question. Um, so it, if, if it doesn't spit out assembly, it probably doesn't actually make assembly, but it does something very, very similar to that along the way and then converts that into ones and zeros. Um, yep. Yeah. Gabe. So Gabe asks, so interpreter, um, 
like a, in, in in this case is IRL in real life interpreter. Oh, like a like a uh, yeah 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 a, a language interpreter. Right. Yes. Um, translating each line someone says to another while a compiler sits down with the whole paragraph and does it together. Yeah, yeah, that's not a bad way of looking at it. The whole conversation together, right? And then just delivers like the transcript or, you know, it's not, it's not perfect because natural language interpreters, you know, there's a, there's, you're done and it's just content, but it is, that's right. It is that idea of interpreting it in real time. Um, okay. So now you've got ones and zeros that are literally just like in memory, okay? And now you get to what we call the microarchitecture again. That term is not important uh, to you in this context. At this point, the CPU, the processor, starts grabbing instructions out of memory, grabs the program, one instruction, one machine instruction at a time. It, and it does what we'll call later, we'll look at it, the fetch decode execute cycle. It's going to fetch an instruction, it's going to decode it to make some sense out of it, and then it's going to execute it. Okay? And by the way, that's another example. In computer science, execute means something very specific. It has nothing to death, nothing to do with death and putting, you know, putting criminals to death. You know what I mean? It has nothing to do with that kind of execution. It's a term that is disambiguated in CS, meaning to run a program, and run is also disambiguated. Um, anyway, when you're running those instructions, there's a bunch of crap that's got to happen in order for that to happen, and all that crap, are, we call them circuits, okay? And this is all the stuff that's way down there, digital logic circuits. These are like things that like add stuff together, perform math, um, that like are like clocks that can, that can keep track of time, memory, you know, all that kind of stuff. And when you get down there, it really does kind of turn into alphabet soup sometime. The ALU and the S and the CPU and the, and the something, you know, the blah, blah, blah. And I, and I don't want to bog you down with this stupid alphabet soup. Um, but there are these circuits. Okay. How do we build the circuits? We build the circuits with a horribly ambiguous term, which is something we call devices. Well, the, the semiconductor people call these devices, but they are semiconductors. They're integrated circuits. They are the, they are the littlest, tiniest little parts where the ones and zeros get manipulated. Okay. Um, and then that's where it starts. So when we're going to do the class, we're going to start here. And then we're going to build those into circuits. We're going to build circuits into, a, you know, the, the architectural components. We're going to build that into the computer idea. We're going to do all this conceptually. And then on top of that, we're going to give you machine language. And then we're going to give you assembly language. And then we're going to stop. Okay? We're not going to give you C. We're not going to give you Python. We're not going to give you all the other stuff. It's that connection. But once you understand that there's this assembly thing, and that all other high-level language get, languages get converted into that, then you're going to be equipped for your rest of your career to see that little connection all the way down to where the magic happens, which is pretty cool. And I want you to kind of come away with that that conceptual framework, even if you don't remember, you know, all the details later. That's okay. The conceptual framework is going to be really um, uh, valuable. Okay. Whew, that's the tour, man. That's the tour. Um, okay, so here's a question. So let me see. Any Is there anything about any of that that anybody's still noodling on or wondering about? I will take any silence as a no. I do have a question on like the homework. Uh, yeah, hit me. Uh, number two, like the second one where you're supposed to like uh, connect black boxes. Oh, mm hmm. I don't really understand like exactly what we're supposed to do. Um, let me ask you this. Is this, 
because I think it's a good question. And uh, we can do this a couple ways because we've got like 10 minutes left. This is the end of module one. So, right, there's a few things I want to hit, hit on that don't have to happen like right now. And is this a common enough, you know, concern? Because we can also do like a little help section right after class or we can even record a little help section or, you know what I mean? But if it's a, if it's of significant enough interest, we can just take like five minutes right now and I can pull that homework up and we can kind of walk through it. Um, but yeah, I just, I I just need some votes. Uh, is that disc or disquay? Um, uh, it's disquay, but my name's DJ. Yes. Oh, I like it. I like it. Disquay. So yeah, disquay votes. Yes. Anybody else? Do we have enough critical mass to say, yeah, this is what we kind of like to do right now on that thing? Because there are some there are some questions that pop up. Or did I talk about this already a little bit? It seems like I did. Not sure. I thought I did just a little bit in class. Hang on. I'm looking in my recycle bin because I just have a memory. I have a memory. This I just pulled out of my recycle bin. So I did have a memory. Um, and you're like, really? You just pulled it out of your cycle bin? Yes, I did. Um, but let me just, let me just talk about it for just a minute. And I don't think it's going to hurt anybody. Um, and let me do, I'm just grabbing actually homework one. Uh, and I'll just, you know, put that on the big screen over here. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Um, let's blow that up. Okay. So let's walk through it. This, this is an, the, the reason why we're doing this for starters, by the way, did I do this last time? Anybody remember? I don't, I know I drew this picture and then I drew it for you. But I don't, I, don't, I don't think we did like a lot of it. I know you mentioned it, but okay. it was like a little bit. It was probably a tiny question or something. Like okay, threw that back in the recycle bin. Okay, so fair enough. So the idea here, what one of the things I'm trying to get you to think about with this exercise is thinking about black boxes and circuits, which becomes a principle. The ability to take some things, put them together, draw a box around it, you know, and call it a thing with inputs coming in and outputs going out. We call them black boxes, right? And then we're gonna do that and put some of those together and make a bigger box. That's what we're, that's why we're doing it. But the problem basically says, imagine you got these black boxes. Here's just three examples, right? A, B, and C, which takes two values as inputs, adds them together, that's this black, black box, and uh, spits out the sum, right? So if you put a two and a three out the side, would come five, right? And uh, that's A. And you also got another black box that can multiply two numbers. Like, you know, imagine that was two and three. What was what did I do before? Two and three and it kicked out five. This one, two and three come in and it kicks out a six. Okay? So that's what it's trying to do. And, uh, and then you can also like string them together. Like imagine that this was like two, M was two, N was three, P was four, right? I'd go the two and the three would come through the plus box, a five would pop out here. And then that was a four, five times four, a, a 20 would pop out here. Does that make sense? You're just stringing, and we're using variable names, M, N, P, uh, you know, in our in their tradition of algebra to represent an idea. And then of course, when real numbers pop in, then actual numbers pop out, you know what I mean? But in the meantime, this describes the function. Is that all good so far? So that's what I was doing, A plus B. I did number A in the, um, in, it was A that I just threw back into my recycle bin and I'm rescuing it yet again. <laughs> okay, it says, no, I didn't, I didn't do it. Ah, oh. mm, back in the bin, okay, hang on. Let's just do, let's do A real quick, okay? So we got to do, we got to do A times B 
plus C, right? That's what we're doing. I'm going to go with something darker here. Um, might be more readable. All right. So how do I do A times B, right? AB, which is A times B. How do I do that? Bueller. Somebody? Everybody go away. Come on. Okay. We're going to do this. I mean, I'm assuming we're using the multiplying box. Right? It's just this guy here. Right? That's AB is basically put an A there, put a B there. Right? And then it's a multiply box. And, the result, you know, you're going to get something like this, for example. Right? The answer down here is going to be whatever A times B is. That's A, that's B. All right. Then I'm going to add that answer to the value C. So what's the box I've got for doing a plus? Oh, I don't know. The plus box. Let's do that. This is my magic whiteboard. I hope you're all impressed. So, and we get something like that, right? So that that a and b multiply to give us a b that value becomes one of the a mirror image here so that's why i look so uncoordinated that's one of the inputs into the plus box and then the c is another input right and then what pops out of that is a times b plus c i'm just stringing these boxes together that's it by the way when you do the homework draw boxes and then on the exam, when we have you do this, there's a supplemental exam where you actually draw the boxes and upload your a picture. Because otherwise, trying to describe this is just a pain. The box, the pictures with the boxes, way, way easier. So for number, or for B, would we, so it's you average them, would you have a square where you divide it by four? Would that be an acceptable thing for a square? No, you, you don't do have a, a you're only given... Okay, so you have you have a plus and a and a multiply, and I don't know if we're mm, 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 Walter. Uh, I don't know if we are. I think it's ambiguous, and I don't think it's super clear to say. Because you do have an unlimited number, and it does say these, but that's not that's not completely um, uh, unambiguous. Because you, you do need to use only the plus and the and the multiply. So Walter, we got it. Could you do something? Oh. What's that? Could you do something like um, A plus B in one box, C plus D in another, and then add those two in the next, and then like times that by one fourth or something? Um, Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They don't have to be. They don't have to be. Uh, integers, right? There's nothing that says they got to be integers. I just need to get these four numbers added together. Well, I can add two numbers at a time, right? In fact, I can do it. I can do that with like um, adding four numbers together. I can do a couple of ways. Use my magic whiteboard. What do we write? The one fourth in the box? No, no. The box is simply the operation. The one fourth has got to be one of the values that's going in to the multiply box. So, for example, if I go A, B, C, D, hang on a second, you know, and this is like the sum. So, if I do something like this, right, and I go, right, that's A plus B, and then that's C plus D. So, right, and if I put that value and then that value together and add those together, right, I get the summary. The summary. I get the sum. But another way to do that would be something like this. Hang on. It's coming. All right. Another way to do that would be something like this, right? Where I just take, I take 
a plus b right i take that sum and i and i add that to c right and then i take that sum and i add that to d and i could do it that way and either of these two ways is is perfectly fine right this guy basically what i've done is I've essentially done that algebraic, right? In terms of order of operations. I did A plus B first, then I did C plus D, then I added them together, right? That's what that is, right? That makes sense. This one is actually, let me see. This one, the order of operations actually goes like this. It's the same answer because of all those commutative, whatever, associative laws of addition. Doesn't matter which of these two, you know, which of these two uh, orders of operation you decide to use, right? They're going to yield the same answer. But this guy is, right? You go A plus B first. Where am I? A plus B first. Then you add C. Then you add D. And that's the order of operations. So that gives you the summation. And then you can multiply. Cool. The, you know, the exercise itself is a little arbitrary. You know what I mean? Oh, shoot. Did we just drop out? Uh, so. Did I just drop? No. No, you're, 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 you're still here. Yeah. OK. I mean, did my video drop? Because I just got a notion. I just got a. Sorry. Just got I a, do not know. I I just got a notification. I just got a notification. For anybody watching the video, I'm just curious. Uh, I got a notification that OBS had had uh, was like reconnecting, and it's not what you want to see. As far as the stream on um, Discord, you're good. I don't know about YouTube though. Okay. I don't know if that has anything to do with the YouTube. Yeah, I don't know. I'm good. You're you've been consistent. Okay. It's gotta be, it's gotta be an effect on YouTube because anyway, I, I know why. Okay. All right. Hey, so here's the deal. We are, uh, we are out of time. Um, I hope that helps. I want to just say one thing about number, uh, C and D. Okay. You gotta, you gotta dust off your algebra on number C. I mean, you can do number C straight up, like the simple way, the dumb way, the straightforward way. But to do D, you got to solve it. I'm not going to tell you because I want you to labor through it a little bit and also just dust off your algebra a little bit, which you need to dust off your algebra. Um, and if you don't need to dust off your algebra, then this should be, it should take you like two minutes. If it doesn't take you two minutes, you need to dust off your algebra. Um, um, but where you're like going to be you, like, can you give us like... Hot mic. Can you give us like a hint for oh, D? Because D was the D was the only one I got all the other ones. D was the only one I yeah, could figure. The out. hint like, I'm going to give you what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, but it's but it said you could only have one output, so I don't know how to do it with just one box and one multiplication box. Yeah, well, what I'll do, and I will talk to individuals, uh, you know, a little bit more. But here's the hint that I will give you. Um, so it is only one, this D is only one addition box and only one multiplication box. You know you're constrained, right? By that, you know that. Um, and obviously if you have a one addition box and one multiplication box, um, you know, you can either, they have to, the output's got to pop out of only one of them. So they've either got to be, this guy goes first, right? It's either got to be this or this, where the output of this guy becomes one of the inputs to that guy, and then the output comes out, and that's the answer, right? You see that? You see my claw mm -hmm. hands? It has to only be one of that or that with addition and multiplication. That's that's one clue. The first clue, the zeroth clue, is dust off your algebra. But the, the next clue is it's got to be in that orientation or that orientation, okay? And then the second thing, you can look at it and you can see that there's a multiplication right there, right? A times A. There's a multiplication, B times B. There's a multiplication of three numbers, right? Two times A times B. And you got two additions. Well, guess what? You need to somehow, this is algebra. 
you need to be able to look at that expression, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, and ask yourself, this is the only last clue I'm going to give you. You have to just ask yourself, is there a way to say that exact same thing in algebra using only one multiplication and one addition? I like, I know the formula. I understand what it is. I just can't figure it. Like if you only have one output, I don't understand how it's possible. How do you help me understand? Here, look, if I've got, I've got two okay, boxes. Am I, if I do, if I do the addition first, am I doing it wrong? Am I supposed to do multiple? I'm not going to answer that part, but I will tell you this. If I have something like, you know, A, B, C, if I have something like this, right. And I stack up mm -hmm. two boxes, there's only one output, two boxes, one output. Whether that's a multiply or a plus, you know, independent of that, I can stack. I can, in other words, the, the the question you asked that you don't understand how there can be one output. This is how there can be one output. Two boxes, stuff coming into them, and only one output. And then it might be that that's a plus and that's a multiply, or it might be that that's a multiply and that's a plus. Either way, what, does that make sense? The one output part of that confusion is all I'm addressing. Okay. Does that make sense though? Because I see one output and so I don't know, I'm, I'm sincerely trying to understand. I just drew you a picture of one output and two boxes. Mm -hmm. I know so it's I, not the it's not the end one it's it's the the first one it doesn't doesn't the second box have to take the same input twice no so wouldn't you have to well, it might I mean I don't know input? it might that's up to you you can have the same you can have the same box value coming into the same oh I see what, okay what you're talking about is one in, what is one output is okay I think I understand your question back to the ambiguity i was thinking of this as the as the one output the grand output no, 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 what no, you're no. talking yeah. about i'll draw this and i'll offer this as a hint and tell you it's okay that's okay does oh, that help okay, so then I, that, okay. that probably cracks yeah off. i was and i so don't want because like, on the on the on the literally in the problem it says there can only be one output so i was like oh i have no idea how to solve this see what you're saying okay so walter we got <laughs> that's, no, that's ambiguous that is amb no absolutely right that's ambiguity in our in our problem statement and that really does need to be clearer can we clarify by saying on one final like, output? I was stuck on that for like 30 minutes because I was like, I don't know how to solve it. It was so simple, but I couldn't figure it yeah, out. Yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. sense with the constraint. Well, and that's on me, and I apologize because that is that is on this thing. I think, Walter, we just have to be able to say it's fair to split an output. It's still one output, but it can go because wires, the reason why, the reason why that, this is the what's called the curse of knowledge, okay? Um In, in kind of normal circuit stuff, that is totally reasonable, right? An output comes out and it splits. But that's the curse of knowledge. I didn't think of that. This is the fifth, oh, hey, sem this is the fifth semester, by the way, that that's been a pro really has been a problem. And I've only now kind of seen that. Um, yeah, Walter. It, it doesn't say anything on that question about only one output. Um, does it say that anywhere about only one output? It no, does say it outputs it, it, their sum. Um, I think it was on the homework or whatever the other thing we had that said black boxes on it was what said it then. If it was on oh, that pause. Did you take the exam already? Yeah, I think it was the exam that said it. Um, we'll double check it. We'll double check it. And really sincerely, I, I apologize for, you know, like burned time. I mean, I mean, if, if I'm wrong and I just thought it said that, but I'm pretty sure it did. Yeah. But I, but also I think it's fair to be, to be, to be, you know, it's not going to hurt us any to draw a picture like this. You know what I mean? That, that just says, mm -hmm. Hey, this is also fair. There's always a risk of giving too much. If you say too many words, then there's a certain cross section that begin to be confused when they weren't before. You know what I mean? And you can sometimes like, you know, express too much, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not going to hurt us to articulate that idea, that splitting idea. 
Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's what that does is it's an unnecessary complication created by yeah, the that's ambiguity. Totally true, in this... When I saw the when I saw the the part of the thing that said you could have they don't have to necessarily be integers that confused me until I got to the second question. Yeah, exactly. Then yeah, that's because you're like, well, what's not an integer? Oh, fractions. Um, another way to say that is the inputs and outputs can be fractions too. They can be any number. So I think we, I think it can be cleaner because I'm okay. I'm okay. If students, if you, if you labor and you get value out of it, I'm not okay when I inadvertently induce suffering and time burn that it, that doesn't need to happen. You know what I mean? Then that's on me and that's not good. So we need to, we need to change that. I mean, it's fine. If it's on the exam, we'll just take it again, right? Well, you now know. I mean, you can, you can go, re, you can retake the exam and you're going to know, and you're going to be fine, but still, I'm just saying, I want to make it right. I want to make it, we, we got to clean that up. Um, and we will. So we'll do that. I'm going to do that right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for that feedback. And thanks for persevering. Cause I really didn't understand like what you were, what the problem was, right? Like, I don't understand. And, uh, we finally got to it. So that's good. Okay. All right. Well, we're way over time, but uh, hopefully all of that is helpful to everybody. And uh, okay, it's bingo time and it's bingo has happened. Module one, homework, go. Everybody should submit module one homework tonight. And ideally take the exam right afterwards. You gotta have Proctorio installed. I apologize for that. Recycle bin. Okay, see everybody. Thanks, Dr. K. You bet, Eddie. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, thank you. So for Proctorio, we'll have to have like the camera set up and everything. Yeah, yeah. All right. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Alrighty. Uh, hey, Dr. K, uh, I just had a question about uh, number C. I was just doing the homework as whoever was talking um i just i just wanted to make sure um am i able to so i just had a, like a question on the the homework worth the p what does that p like represent is it like an integer is that what it represents some number any number like how, it's just, it's just any, so i yes yeah, okay number. um so let, let's say for example to kind of get two a b this is just looking at c if i do a and B and I times that and I have A and B, I could just put a two and kind of point that. It's really hard to, to kind of describe it with your not without the drawing. Yeah. But well what um, you're talking about, I think, I still got my I still got my video up, right? I mean imagine imagine that that was a multiply instead of a plus, right? Mm -hmm. And the numbers were two A and B. Well, wherever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like two A and B. So that would give you two times A. And then that times B. Oh, see what I mean? Okay. So I could have three just connecting in one box. Is that correct? No, you're you are limited to only, only just two. Two inputs. Only two. Yep. You are limited two to two values okay. as inputs. But multiplication, I can right, I can do A times B, then I can do that times two, and I can string those together. Okay. All right. That makes sense. All right, Sam. That awesome. If I have any questions, I'll just maybe should, would I just have to message you? Yeah, that, just just drop it in the DM queue. Yeah, put it in the DM queue okay. to say, hey, I got a question. You don't even have to say what cool. it's about, or I got a module one question.